This episode of the Flush Podcast is brought to you by Walton's Inc. Walton's has everything you need to process and prepare your wild game, including instructional videos and experts that will help you answer your questions. Plus, Walton's now has their own podcast called Meat Gistics, from animal to edible. Find it wherever you found our podcast and find their products and services at waltonsinc.com. Today, my guest is one of America's most well-known upland bird hunters. Ron Baim and I break down our incredible public land bird hunting adventure on the islands in the center of Lake Michigan. Welcome to another episode of the Flush Podcast. I'm Travis Frank. I'm your host. Brandon Morton is our producer. As always, I'm thankful for the amazing job he does to keep us connected and uh, get our guests connected in this uh, digital world that we're in. Ron Bame, it took how long to get you locked, locked in? Well, as I see it, I'm looking at 10.15 on my watch, and I think we started about six minutes to 10. So that's not bad. 23 minutes, um, you know. Or 21 minutes, 21 minutes. Uh, hey, look, it's not my fault that you guys just don't use telephones and Zoom recorders. You've got a recording studio, Travis, so I'm jealous, and you're just going to have to deal with it. Well, you're a professional, right? I mean, we've got, <laughs> we've had so many other people join us with ease, and here I'm talking to one of the most well-known podcast producers in the country and we can barely get you hooked up let's wait let's let's get that right you're talking to one of the most well-known upland podcast hosts who has the least amount of technical savvy <laughs> of all podcasts well i'm glad we got you figured out thanks to brandon i appreciate yeah. him as always yeah. how in the world are you able to get a podcast on the internet in this day and age you know, when I started five and a half years ago, uh, I looked up literally how to do a podcast and I got a, a Zoom recorder and I used to take, you'll love, Brandon will love this, the producer. I used to take my phone and lay it on, put it on speaker and then I tilted on a swivel holder, the microphone top, and I would record it right off the audio that came off the phone. It was, it was terrible, but I was so <laughs> proud that I had a podcast. I didn't care. And I think somewhere around year one or year one and a half, I think I, uh, I found an, a JBL external speaker. So it added a little bass to it. <laughs> so, yeah. But Travis, I'm telling you, my, my hunting ability far exceeds my technical ability. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far. I've hunted with you, too. <laughs> okay, is that, is that what we're going to talk about today, our hunting trip? <laughs> we took? Yeah, that's that's what I want to dig into. But uh, how are – so I'm new to the podcast world, right? And when we started doing this, face-to-face -face conversations, it's so easy to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Mm -hmm. But now everything is, you know, I can't see you right now. I'm talking to you. Right. I don't even know where are you, by the way. Oh, I'm sitting in the kennel, and the kennel is basically what most people refer to as their man cave. And okay. uh, it, I've got a, a really big, giant, high-top table here that is covered with all kinds of different gear and gadgets and cigar boxes and empty beer cans and you name it. And uh, it's high enough to where my dogs can't just walk by and steal something off of it, but they can stand on their back feet and do it. Um, so that's, I'm in Twin Lake, Michigan at my, at my kennel in my house in Michigan. So, uh, yeah. And the technical part of it, I think we got that solved. Just let's mm -hmm. not, when, when we obviously will direct a few people to my podcast, let them know ahead of time that the sound quality will not be this good. Oh, I don't know. You, you've got a good show. I, I enjoy it. One thing that I've learned or that I learned that I don't like about recording this way is that like if you're talking and there's sometimes a delay, I've jumped right into the middle of people's conversations so many times over the last few months. It drives me insane, insane. Yeah, I always yeah. feel bad about it. But we, we're doing our best and I know you're doing your best and and I, I just appreciate you taking the time today to join us. Um, so this week on 
The Flush, uh, airing right now on the Outdoor Channel, uh, is our adventure run into the center of Lake Michigan on the Beaver Island Archipelago Complex. We hunted rough grouse and woodcock out there. <clears throat> our, our mutual friend, Brent Pike, was the one who, he, he was the brainchild of this adventure. But yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 it was one of those places where it's so unique that I, I wanted to have you on the show today to just kind of break it down. I think we should, because it's a public land adventure. Um, I don't know anybody else that's ever done it. Do you? No, no, I, I've, uh, I, I've drove, I drove north on the hall road, almost to the Arctic circle. And I saw, I still saw people I didn't know on the side of the road. So <laughs> here we are in the middle of Lake Michigan and there is not another soul on this Island. You know, right, that, right. that was just, I'm not saying it was scary, but it was odd. I almost felt like, oh, we're going to bump into somebody. Somebody's got to be parking their boat on the other side of this island, surely. And it, 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 it felt different than public land to me. I don't know about you, Travis, but it felt, it felt almost like, uh, uh, exp like being an explorer almost. Mm hmm yeah, I, I do remember, I think I asked Brent like four times while we were hunting, are you sure this is all public land? Like, are you all right? It's okay that we can be, I'm pretty sure I asked him at least four times, maybe five. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's it's a state of Michigan. It's open. Anybody can come out here. But I, so what we experienced now, if we take it back to the start of our adventure, there was there were several of us. Our plan was to get on the Beaver Island Ferry which is a boat that goes from Charlevoix, Michigan, out to Beaver Island. And I want to say they do two, two trips a day, even during the off-peak time of the year, which is when we were out there. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Bam came in. and, <laughs> and I, I, I did not bring that weather with me, trust me. <laughs> So the the National Weather Service and and we try our best to to show the reality of what we're dealing with and you can see the waves on the show but most people when I said twenty foot waves they looked at them I'm sure they were like that guy's an idiot they weren't twenty footers but on the main lake they really were the the National Weather Service said they they had waves that were twenty foot swells yeah. so the the Beaver Island boat uh, was canceled. You and I reluctantly got on the Island Airways airplane. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> and so, oh yeah. Oh, describe that. Okay. So you got there before you already took off. So we didn't have any communication with you, which probably would have scared us from getting in the plane if you'd have told me what your flight was like. So right. you're on. You're now on Beaver Island with your cameraman, and and a few of us are just arriving at the Charlevoix airport. And uh, I think you're gonna love this. I think there was a sign there, but we didn't recognize it, okay? You know, you met Bravo, my big my big Bravo Italiano, what a clown he is, right? Yep, yep. He must have known something because, you know, this, this is a private airline, so there's no TSA and everything. We're gonna bring the dogs right into the plane, sit on the seats and the dogs sit right between our legs. And so the pilot getting ready to go takes that yellow, wheel chuck and it's got a rope on it right and he yanks it out and he flings it back into the hangar bravo picks it up and brings it back to the pilot <laughs> that's a true story <laughs> and i don't know if bravo said i don't want to go into plane put the wheel chuck back or if he just thought the guy was playing fetch but we got on that plane and uh you know and prop planes are loud and shaky and these planes are all older than well, they're all older than you are. They're not all older than me. But uh, we we took off and we hit a side wind that literally, as we were taking off, I don't think we were 70, 50, 80 feet in the air. And the plane, if it was shooting at 12 o'clock, the plane was facing 3 o'clock, but still going in the direction of 12 o'clock. Was that what your experience was when you took off before us? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It literally... Okay. We, we were barely treetop height in a dang yep. plane turned Turn to the sideways. side. And I'm like, and I told Brent, and, and you and I have talked about this a few times. Um, I told Brent, I almost died in one of these up in Alaska, and I'm not doing it again. And I debated about getting in that airplane. It's a six-person six, six person plane. 
Yeah. And the winds were, I don't know, 40, 40 mile an hour winds. I mean, something like that. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it was sweet. right under the cutoff, whatever the cutoff is for the plane. If it was 40 or 45, it was like the pilot went, oh, yeah, that's just a couple miles an hour under the cutoff. And so my question to Travis is you, Travis, is when you yeah. landed and kissed the tarmac over on the island, why yeah. did you not call us and give us a warning? Were you afraid we wouldn't get on the plane? Well, I know not necessarily, but I, you know, like, I don't know if maybe because I had a bad life changing experience in one that I'm, you know, a little bit of a wuss when it comes to getting in those. But I thought, you know, Brent is like, oh, yeah, no big deal. Let's hop in. Let's go. And I'll be out there. If you guys want to come, great. If you want to wait till tomorrow, that's fine, too. So I'm thinking, wow, I'm just I'm I'm the only one here, apparently, that thinks this is ridiculous. <laughs> and so I didn't I just shut my mouth. I'm here. I made it. I'm alive. Uh, and then I was glad to see you guys show up and you felt oh. the same way that I did. But you made it. You made when, it, which when we okay. met on the island, yeah, we, the first thing we had to talk about was that plane ride, and it was like we all lived through a gri a, a grizzly bluff, right? right? A grizzly bluff <laughs> attack. No, nobody got hurt, nobody got scratched, but we simultaneously or in two different spots and time, you know, two different time fragments, we both had a bluff charge from a mama grizzly, mm -hmm. and, and we got on the mainland and we're like, "How was your plane ride? Plane ride? Oh my god!" <laughs> So <laughs> we embraced for a moment there. Yes, we 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 had a good got, connection. Yeah, everything did get better after that plane ride, though. You know, yeah, it really did. So Charlotte, uh, uh, Beaver Island. So that's that's a pretty large island. That's kind of like the main one. The the, uh, the Beaver Island complex is like I don't know, thirteen islands, something like that. Twelve, thirteen islands. There's really a handful of main ones. Beaver is the only one that has any life on it, any human right. activity. The rest of them are abandoned islands way out there. And I want to say it's like, um, we're like 30 miles. Is that right? Or is it more than that out into the mainland or uh, off the mainland? I think it's more like 40, 40 to 50, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, it's a, even with that, you know, plane, it was a 20 minute plane and a plane goes, you know, well, of course in that headwind, I don't know what the plane was doing, but, um, yeah. you know, it was, uh, this is a 20 minute flight over. I, I think it's a 50 mile ride into the, you know, into the Beaver Island. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were planning it, I told Brent, I'm like, well, I got a, you know, a 20 foot fishing boat. Uh, maybe I'll just drive it out there and then we can haul all our gear out. And he goes, I don't think you're going to want to do that. So when we break down this hunt uh, and if you want to do it or if somebody wants to do it, I, my recommendation right off the top is do not plan to bring your own fishing boat and drive to this island. It is way the hell out there. And that is serious water that you're yeah. crossing to, to get to it. So the Beaver Island Ferry, you can drive your truck onto that ferry. It's big enough. You can take your vehicle mm -hmm. um, yep. and your dogs and everything. You can do that if you want. I just looked again today to figure out what the price is on that. Run for the off-peak season, which was, you know, when we went in October, it was $27 trip to, to load up and, and take the ferry. The Island Airways is a hundred and ten dollar round trip flight for a, one person, sixty two dollars for your dog. So th Could, we're not talking a, a, just um, you know, you're not breaking the bank to have to do this, which is something that it instantly comes into a lot of people's minds. But you do have to get there. So Beaver yeah. Island, there they said I think five hundred people call it home year round. I think that's a lie. I bet at least half or three quarters of those 500 leave in the winter months and go yeah. somewhere warmer. Um, I would, but I would I, agree with you. I, we didn't see, I don't think we saw 15 cars on that island driving around, you know. Right, right. I, I, I think we saw a lot of houses and a lot of vacation homes. But, yeah, I, I would doubt that there's, you know, that, that statistic may be flawed. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, they have their res their residence, right? They that's their residency, even though they may go to Florida or Arizona right. or something during the winter. Right. But it's a tourist island for sure. I mean, you can tell right now yeah. we're talking mid July. It's probably well pre COVID. It was probably yeah. just rocking. I they're oh, back yeah. up and running. I yeah, I believe you're in Michigan right now. So you guys, are you open, semi open over there? We're we're semi open. Um, but, you know, like we just got this order from the governor to 
we were kind of one of them states that said, please use masks, but mm-hmm. people weren't really enforcing it. And then so our governor said, listen, <laughs> listen, everybody. So the store, it, it's kind of like we're stepping back a little bit. They're, they're getting a little bit nervous. Um, we, I think we're not, we weren't opening too fast, but I think they're, they're trying to keep it open, but they're trying to be more cautious. So yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Beaver Island and all those vacation places are suffering uh, just mm-hmm. from the tourist part, but I'll bet you anybody who wants to get away from it all and has property up there, what a better place to be. You know, that, that uh, got a little grocery store, got a couple taverns, got a gas station. What else could you need on a, on a, on a trip? Yeah, no doubt about it. And you've got wilderness, you've got fish, you've got critters. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously hunting season isn't open right now, but uh, just the opportunities that are out there. I don't typically like to, um, you know, when I go to a place and we film a show just like you, you don't really want to expose a resource so that it gets overrun. Uh, right. You know, so when we talk about this, I, I think this is something that people can do on this island complex, but also others, right? I mean, there are mm-hmm. others in the Great Lakes that oh, yeah. are probably gonna be similar. I wouldn't be surprised if I plan another one to a different location just to see if I can. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I won't, but <laughs> after, after what we well, learned, there's, but. There's always Drummond Island. We could try that sometime, but yeah. um, I think they got more, unfortunately, I think they got more horseshoe snow, uh, horseshoe rabbit, or horseshoe, snowshoe rabbits than they do grouse. But, really? Uh, that, that comes from time to time. But, uh, you know, what I was shocked at was like Beaver Island. We got to Beaver Island. Of course, we landed there and you kind of see the island and whether you got off the car ferry or the plane. That didn't feel anything like those two archipelago islands that we we're on. Mm-hmm. It, I would agree. Even, even when we were driving, because as long as you're on some kind of a road or a trail with a vehicle, you know, you feel familiar, right? But uh, yeah. when we when we landed that dinghy boat, you know they they anchored the big boat and then an- and then took us on the dinghy. And when I say dinghy, <laughs> that was a dinghy. <laughs> it um, really was. Yeah. It really was. So then we get to this island, and there isn't even there's a foot trail. Not even if you could get the big boat there and back your truck up, there'd be nowhere to drive your truck. That's how wildernessy this place is and overgrown it is it's it uh it was a little intimidating yeah yeah they you can tell that a few summer tourists take uh take their boats there and walk around the island there was Mm -hmm. there was old so uh high island and garden island are the two other main islands that we ventured onto, and i think there's like 10 others right something like that yeah, and I think they just keep going down in size to where mm-hmm. I think some of those islands are just a rock outcropping with a, a cedar tree on top of it, you know. But yeah. they always stay above the water level, so I guess that's a, I guess that's a definition of an island. Technically, yeah. If we're gonna get technical here, that's an island. But yeah, so they there were people that lived on those other islands a <clears throat> hundred years ago, and. Mm-hmm. I think the last documented inhabitant of one of those, I believe it was Garden, would have been in 1940s, I believe. I did some research on it when we got back. That mm-hmm. was the last time anybody lived there. So you could see uh, some some um, kind of disheveled buildings, uh, you know, basically just log, small log cabins. And then there was one specific cabin that we actually walked into that um, they've been trying to keep that one from crumbling to the ground, but right. that was, that one had a walking trail and a couple of little signs nearby, um, yeah. that kind of showed, you know, there's, there's walking trails around the Island. So that's the only real sign that humans actually are ever yeah. out and about out there. Now the, the cover as far as bird hunting, um, well, I'll take it step back. I was really surprised that there weren't more critters out on those islands. Like there's no skunks or raccoons or a lot of things that want to eat grouse, but grouse and woodcock were, they dominated the, uh, the, the life I would say besides trees, it was birds. That was about it. Right. Yeah. And you know, when you say that, you know, when I'm hunting uh, here in Michigan or anywhere in the country, especially grouse hunting, 
I'm kind of a, I would say I'm a closet bird watcher. Like I, I could recognize maybe seven or eight different bird calls. Uh, you know, if you hear a woodpecker pecking, you know it's a woodpecker. And, you know, it always draws my attention up to a treetop to see a pileated woodpecker or some ravens, you know, going through. You see a shadow come over you when you're hunting. I don't remember seeing songbirds or anything out there. Did you? No, I don't either. I remember. That's what I'm saying. Well, we were on a scary island. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And they were both their own unique islands, too, because yeah um the 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 first island it to me it felt like northwoods thick right i mean there was a lot of underbrush there was a mixture of different trees but right. the second island it's like we were walking on the most miserable it was like yeah. the whole island was a fern and all the branches came about i don't know 36 to 45 right. inches straight up and you were walking on them every you couldn't escape it it was just I don't know if I've ever seen anything like it. I never have either. And and to take note when people see that on the episode, mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of, we only show that, or you only show that cover for, you mentioned it in the episode, but I think you probably showed the best piece of the cover where the camera could actually see it because you and I do not have really long 36 inch inseams. And that <laughs> was the most uncomfortable walking I've ever done in my life. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it was yep. nothing but swatting you step it it felt like you were it's like if somebody set up a, a warehouse of hurdles like for the for the olympic games and a big wind came up and just twisted them all up and then you had to go hunt by walking over that field of tipped over and disheveled hurdles mm -hmm. like if a bird got up you didn't even have a chance because you're trying to figure out where to put your foot the next spot it was uh and there was a couple exceptions to the rule but some of those journeys we took on that island were, you know, when I hear about these people going chucker hunting and, uh, you know, it's all uphill both ways or, or they're, you know, whatever they're doing, they're going to go go hunt. You know what? I don't care where you are. Nobody was walking in that stuff. That's why nobody goes to that island. I'm telling you, Travis. Uh -huh. it, was, right. it was miserable. <laughs> yeah. If, if somebody, I, I'm assuming people are going to want to try it after they've seen it. Uh, I've heard from, you know, it, it just aired yesterday was the first thing I, I heard from a lot yeah. of viewers They're like, wow, that looked incredible. So mm -hmm. I, and it was, I mean, it's one of those places where I'll remember it forever. I mean, it, oh, it's yeah. just, so, it's so different. It's so unique. And I think, you know, like you can go to the, your same, your same, your favorite place again and again and be like, this is my yearly getaway. But there's, I'd say most hunters have this little bit of uh intrigue built in them that i want to try something new and again this is this is public ground so anybody can if they can get to it they can hunt it yeah. uh, and if they do they're gonna say yep ron and travis were right that sucked that was <laughs> right. miserable walking but but what an incredible journey just to see it and yeah. be there and then my dog goes on point and the grouse flushes right um so you, your camera guy even caught a grouse going down from my shot. I was like, when I saw that, I was like, wow, you know, I've never <laughs> seen that on film before. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, if, if you get lucky after enough chances, right. So when yeah, grouse we're, hunting, yeah. when we're filming grouse hunts, I mean, yeah, like we had a lot of footage of walking through that thick, nasty cover, but as a viewer, you say, right. I can't stare at this anymore. It's just like I'm looking at a wall of green. I can't, you know, there's nothing to see here. So we try our best to uh, to show it. How did you feel that episode portrayed our adventure? I I, I think, in fact, it's funny, uh, Brent, I called Brent last night because he goes, did you see the episode? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, what'd you think? I said, I thought it told a story like, I, I wish it was an hour long so it could tell more of the story, but I think from the flight in and the, the difficulty of getting there, the description of the islands, uh, yeah, I, I think I think it told a story. I don't think it left anything out. I really don't. Um, it 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 could have left. It, it might have left out like everybody falling and everybody trying to get up, and <laughs> it might have actually made it seem a little more traversable because. At one yeah. point, we lost your cameraman. We, we literally right. lost him. That's right. Yeah. Remember? He, yes, that's right. So, <laughs> now, 
Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. He, he reached. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, he went. Uh, he went south and needed to go north. Or something right. along those lines. Right. When we hit, when we went to, uh, we reached a massive bank, and it was Lake Michigan. <clears throat> right. He saw. He said he saw the dog go that way. Well, the dog mm-hmm. just ran a little loop and came back to us. So he went right. that way and kept on going. And I remember walking down the shoreline for about a mile, but yelling until I finally <laughs> caught up to him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh, well, okay, I'm glad you said that about the episode because that's our, always our goal is to be as accurate as we possibly can. Um, you know, and I, we, you know, looking back at it, I guarantee we could have made an hour long show out of it because there was so much more to it, right. but, um, that's kind of what we, you know, that's what we're, we're given. And so that's what we do. But, uh, right. yeah, so here's, here's how you break it down. Right. Um, so you flight in 110 bucks, $62 for your dog round trip, right? So less than $200 there. Um, if you want to do the flight or even way less than that, if you want to do the boat, uh, ferry. And then we, we booked captain Mike weed, who was right. just about to head South for the winter, but right. he knew we were coming. So he stayed. So he does, he operates out of paradise Bay dive shop and his big boats called resolute. And he takes people on dives and scenic tours around. So he's like, uh, you were going to go what hunt? Yeah, I guess I can drop you off. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was our guide and that was it basically. So it's either an airplane, a big boat and a little boat or a really big boat, a pretty good size boat. And then a tiny dinghy to get to, to, yeah, no matter what, you're not getting out of it without the dinghy. You got to have the dinghy. <laughs> you have to. You absolutely have to have that part. So it's feasible. It's. I'm not sure. Uh, we stayed at at Brent's uh, grandma's place at her mm-hmm. cabin. Um, turned that into a grouse camp. So I can't tell people, you know, what the lodging prices would be, but right. I would guess it's comparable to any other. Um, any other destination you're going to go to that time of the year, it's yeah. not peak season for tourists. So trust me when I say there's nobody else on the island, you're going to have lodging available. Uh, so yeah. it's a cool, it's a, it's a cool adventure. Any la- any other thoughts about the island, Ron? <clears throat> well, I, I was going to tell you, kind of tongue in cheek, I heard that if you buy some pike gear from Brent, that he'll tell you where the key to grandma's grandma's cabin is. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I hope that doesn't cost me a sponsorship. But anyway, um, no, I would say what you said about if somebody wanted to do the adventure, this is if I was going to redo it, I would do it this way. I would I would take the ferry over if, if the seas were safe, of course, or you know, obviously if the ferry travels, it's safe. So I would bring all my gear in my truck and my dogs. That's the cheapest way to get to Beaver Island. I would get a hold of mm-hmm. uh, the captain. I would unload that gear and have some camping gear instead of trying to spend a night on beaver island and traversing i would pay for the captain to take us to let's just say high island drop us off all your gears in your truck it can go right to the parking lots right there by the boat i'd bring all your gear your dogs on the boat have them drop you off on the island and come back two or three days later and have them get you that i mean i think that would be a and i'll be really if you yeah. think about it the what i don't know what the price of the boat was but the uh, price of taking that ferry across there with your dogs, bring your own tent, your own gear, your own beer, your own food, mm-hmm. get on that boat. Um, I I not only affordable. Um, you I think once you got to know that island, that's the one thing that we couldn't do. Trying to figure out, you know, rough grouse are hard wherever you hunt them, unless you go to some like uh, uh, what would you call a drainage in Montana where they've never seen a person. Th- mm-hmm. Those birds, um, they held for points better than I thought they would. But as far as being escape artist, there's the, the foliage, the stem density is so thick on that island. We, if we'd have stayed on one of those islands for a few days and, and kind of got a little, uh, what would you call it? Like a little game plan going. Yeah. I, I, I think we could have really done, not that we didn't do good. We got birds, but uh, there was some difficulty there. Like you're not used to hunting by the side of Lake Michigan where, a person could actually have, like when you say a flanker, you could keep a flanker on the beach on Lake Michigan. 
you know, where, right. where would you right. hunt that you would do that? So I think we could have really dialed it in. And uh, if, if people were going there, I would ferry it and then uh, hire the hire the resolute and uh, dingy yourself out to one of the islands for a couple of days, three days. Yeah, that's you make a good point. I mean, obviously, the camping side of it would be really would be really cool. But I think, um, you know, what we learned that morning, it took us a few hours. We kept running into a lot of um, uh, uh, the the woodcock. The migration was on. So we ran into those everywhere we went. But when we finally got into the grouse, it was after a full morning. But when we figured it out, it was pretty um, obvious. As soon as there was any sort of an opening of any yeah. kind, 20 yeah. feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, it's all yep. it took. There was yep. at least one bird in every single one of them. And so you can take like an onyx or an aerial view on your phone and look and say, mm -hmm. well, there's a little something different. Let's head to that. Or there's a little something different. And then obviously the old settlers planted apple trees on those islands. That right. was that was the difference. That was the change of trees. There was the mm -hmm. food, the buds, you know. And so <clears throat> really, once we learned that, if we had stayed on the same island for a second day, no doubt we would have been not <clears throat> not lethal because they're still they're still the king and they can still escape like nothing else. But yeah, we would have oh, had yeah. a lot a lot more shots because I think we got into you know we saw maybe two grouse in the morning the first day and then mm -hmm. we probably saw twenty five or thirty that afternoon yeah. just yeah. to put in perspective of and we touched. I don't know how much of that island we touched around, maybe a tenth of it. Yeah. Yeah. We only had a day on each of the other islands. So we couldn't have covered, we couldn't have covered a lot. We couldn't have covered. And we did a, a fair amount of walking. It wasn't, uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't cut it short. It, we, we, you know, we said, all right, we're going, we are traversing the, the width <laughs> of this island. And then, of course, I, I wasn't going to walk back across that island. And we, we ended up walking. We literally beachcombed. We beachcombed all the way back to camp so we could start hunting again. It was easier to walk back across that island. It was. It was cool adventure. Would you do it again? I well, I told you when I was there, never. Mm -hmm. And I already think like that's that's going to come back in. That's going to come back again. But I, and I will do it. I, I'll pick one of those two islands. Probably the one. Which one had the more more of the apple orchards in it? That was the I'm not going to say. I think you got a oh, garden. No, you're right. Yeah. I don't remember which one it was. <laughs> but yeah. I can uh, I, I can tell you, but I, I want you to go back and figure it well, out again. <laughs> well, you're uh, okay. You want you're just trying to bait me back there again. I get you. I get mm -hmm. you. But you know the point is, we we happen to find the apples on the one island, so mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that those apple trees didn't exist on the other island because they were both inhabited islands. We just found them on the one island, and. Uh, that was certainly a food source, but you remember, you remember when uh, Brent and you were coming back, and I was ahead of you guys because you had to wait for the lost cameraman. And mm -hmm. you guys, there was grouse flushing right out of those spruce trees, right along yep. the shore in Lake Michigan. And you kept it was hearing, like, you could, it was like it was like constant, coveys. They were like coveys yeah. flushing. It was the craziest thing. Right. There, there, they were still in their, uh, you know, the some of them were still in the family groups and you guys, you know, making more commotion, having more dog, it, you guys were hearing these. Pff, 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 and you're telling me, I'm like, where, where? It's at the whole beach we walked, we saw them, you yep. know? And yep. uh, so it was, it was, uh, it, it was, it was a really cool adventure. I've, I could, I could compare that to a caribou hunt I did uh, on the, uh, above the Arctic Circle. Um, and almost in the degree of getting there, the difficulty and the adventure is, is mm -hmm. worth the story in itself. You know, um, I, I've been hunting, I've hunted from New Brunswick to Alaska and all the way down to uh, Florida. So I mean, there's not a lot other than the Southwest, um, that, that trip and that adventure, it, it's right up there with Alaska to me. Mm. Cool. Cool. Uh, what, so that leads me to another question. Do you have a more memorable bird hunt that you've done? You know, other than a first time, like a, my first trip to South Dakota, you know, 25, 27 years ago, where we, mm -hmm. everything came together and we knocked on doors and it, it, that one, I could never replace it. But a lot of that has to do with, you know, the good times and the ease of things. You know, really, you're talking about wild birds on private property with 
no access problem. So what, you know, who could ask for better than that? But mm-hmm. as far as things I never tried before, I, I tend to try things that are you know, odd like that. And then I get a little bit of buyer's remorse. I'm like, well, at least I tried. So yeah, that <laughs> one, that one, there was no buyer's remorse. That was, that was, I would just say I'd put it at my top, whatever my top five hunts would be. And, and uh, I bought my first hunting license in 1972 although I was actually not old enough to, I just told the clerk at the counter when back in the day, you filled them out by pen on, on carbon paper. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'd say since 1973, when I was legally hunting, uh, probably it's gotta be my top five hunts it, for sure. Mm. And that's a, yeah. that's a lot of hunts. <laughs> yeah. I, I put it up there too. It, it's unique. And I think, you know, we, you and I have had conversations since we were on the boat riding across, you know, Lake Michigan, looking at each other. And I remember I, I looked at you, I said, will you come back? And you go, nah, I'm glad <laughs> I did it. But there's other places. I want to know what's next. And that's, I feel the same way. Like I, I enjoy something new. It's new right. to me. That experience will never, well, even if we go back, it's going to be different the next time. And I'm mm-hmm. okay leaving it at that. I'm okay saying, all right, there's, there's probably another one in Lake Superior that we might be able to hunt or, right, right. you know, somewhere in like right now this year, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to cross the border into Canada. I really right. don't. So, right. um, you know, for a, a remote getaway that's still in, you know, the lower, the lower 48, 48. Yeah. Mm-hmm. that's, that's going to be, you know, aside from going to Alaska, which you and I now have to talk about, but, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so what's on your plans for this, this fall? What, what hunts are you looking forward to? Well, right now, um, I've got, I'm going to Kansas in, uh, November, right before Thanksgiving. I've got a hosted hunt for my podcast in South Dakota. There's a lodge out there that, um, my listeners can sign up for, and we all do old fashioned, uh, you can bring it, you know, people bring their dogs. They can go out and hunt for prairie, ta- or prairie chickens and sharp tails maybe in the afternoon. But this is like an old fashioned blockers, pushers, flankers, uh, just a great traditional South Dakota pheasant hunt. Um, so I got that coming up. I'm going to North Dakota to practice on the early, early sharp tails in huns without a gun. And, uh, that, that's something I've, I've done that in the woods in the spring here, got my dog on, on grouse when the woodcock come back. So we'll go out there, you know, pre nesting season. Well, this will be post nesting season and to try to go out in the woods in Michigan and post post nesting season, you're going to be carried away by bugs, black flies, mosquitoes. It's just, it's horrendous, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to head out to North Dakota um, and we're going to take our dogs, a bunch, a bunch of people are going and we're going to get our dogs some early season exercise, no firearms allowed. So, you know, it's perfect. You can't miss a shot. The dogs have all the fun. And, uh, and then I'll probably go back to that general area again in October. Okay. Um, short with Tyler that, Webster. Right? Yeah. With Tyler, you bet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've yep. had Tyler on before too, and he's been on a few of our shows and, that is one guy that, I mean, as far as dialed in to his craft, you know, when it comes to bird hunting, there's a lot of people that talk about it and he does too. He's got his own podcast, but he yeah. lives it and he hunts, I think it's like a hundred and, I mean, he basically hunts a third of the year, right? Yeah. He, he turns that into a trip to South, uh, to Arizona just mm-hmm. to add three or four more weeks to his hunting season. So yeah, he lives in a, a bird rich target rich environment and he takes every opportunity that's like kind of like if i wanted to get into tree trimming michigan would be the place to live right <laughs> okay. right. right right well if i wanted to get into bird hunting i'm telling you as a young person what who, who said it horace greeley go west young man i'd stop somewhere yeah. around Mount, uh, north dakota and i I'd, I'd lay up a I'd, I'd build up a home there but uh, right north so, dakota yeah, that, North Dakota is a special, special place. And that's one thing that we didn't even talk about on the uh, the Beaver Island was our plan was to duck hunt out there too on the big oh, lake. And that's right. we ended up, yeah, we ended up not doing that. And I regret that because I've always wanted to duck hunt on one of the Great Lakes, always in a lay down boat. And, and we saw them buzzing by us when we were out there. I mean, right. it, 
but uh, so yeah, you talk about North Dakota. I mean, that's one of the, the beauties of that state is the variety of birds, the variety of terrain. And oh yeah, by the way, you can throw in a bag of decoys and have the most insane waterfowl hunt of your life. That's just one reason why North Dakota rocks, one of many. Yeah, um, it, it is. It, you're right though. It's it's a state where you can over the counter get your waterfowl tag when you get your small game tag. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you're a judge for NAVDA. What are you guys doing now with COVID? Well, we cancel all the tests up till I think I've got two tests to judge in August. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm not up on maybe a July test. But the the nice thing is about now that things are relaxed as far as groups of people. Um, you know, when we're when we're holding a NAVDA test, whether it's a puppy test or utility test, you've got three judges. You're in a big field, maybe an apprentice or two, and a handler and a dog. There's no need for us to get close to each other whatsoever. So we're just going to be able to walk up. A, a, you know, every once in a while, you, you kind of wander in, and you, you whisper to the other judge, hey, hey, did you see that dog? Did you, I, I missed that. I was looking down. And, you know, uh, we may have to be a little bit more, uh, what's the word, uh, covert about our talking about a dog because we never want the handler to hear what we're talking about. We'll, we'll give them all the information at the end of the day with his scorecard and his numbers. But uh, it, it's kind of, as far as a, an event goes, uh, COVID's not going to bother that now that we're allowed to get in some groups because, you know, we can park our cars far enough apart. Uh, there's, no, there's no two handlers and two dogs interacting together. Like in some, some test formats, you have, you know, two dogs going out at the same time from the same area. I'm sure they could adjust that a little bit. But uh, NAVDA is a test where a single dog goes out for an evaluation with its owner um, and three judges to let you know how your dog's doing. So we'll, we'll be able to handle that, Travis. It won't be uh, – uh, I guess the biggest thing will be people coming in, uh, and they've, they've made some exceptions, they, uh, they'll let – we usually bring out of area judges in. Like if I'm going to hold a test here in August, they'll expect us to bring one judge in from, let's just say North Dakota, because we were saying North Dakota. And what that does is it keeps the judging format. Uh, uh, they kind of mix up the judges. So it's not always three judges that know each other, just to, just in case they were all best friends. They're like, yeah, that dog's, I don't like, I didn't like that dog either. You, you always want to have that good consensus score of a dog. So, um, they did relax the rules. Basically, they said, if you can find three judges that'll get together, whether they fly in or drive in, or if they're all in the same state, just try to get the test held. Because, you know, especially for people with a young dog, they uh, they have up till 16 months of age, which I think they threw a few more months on that uh, to get that puppy test done. And, you know, you get that new dog and you want to be part of the group and and you got the, you're, you've been training or, or getting your dog ready for the test and a test is canceled you feel kind of like oh it's like your kids championship game being canceled you know i i don't yeah. know how that feels anymore but um so but that's what we're doing at navda we're we're just we're going to start holding the tests again we'll just be as cautious as we can you know tell people to bring their own lunches uh there's not a lot of places open uh you know especially these these tests are held in some remote areas uh, but we'll adapt to it. it it won't it won't stop us you know how about how about you guys with filming the shows? Is that messed up your schedule this year? Or are you guys going to be able to go? Are you going to be all quiet? Um, we, I may be camping a lot. <laughs> I, may be, I may be out on the prairie a lot this fall. I don't know. It's a, it's so, it changes so quick, right? I mean, we think we know something and pretty soon, bam, something else changes. So right. we're, it's still July. Um, I have a whole pile of, of uh, ideas, places we want to go. Uh, we have to try to figure out, you know, every state has their own hunting seasons and um, it may be more localized this year. We may be hunting more Midwest and, you know, I won't get to go to California or Nevada or Alaska or, or right. Georgia, or, you know, something like that. But those are places on, on our list that we want to hunt and there's people that we want to, you know, tell stories about. Uh, we're just kind of in a wait and see right now. We haven't right. confirmed anything with anybody. I know a lot of people have reached out and, they said, you know, come here, here. And I just said, I'll, we're, we're keeping everything open at this time. Uh, we are back in the field. But, I mean, things that we're trying to do different uh, for some of our other shows are, you know, we have multiple uh, 
people in the field instead of having just one person on site with a camera or two cameramen. We've got uh, boom mic operators and stuff that, you know, like like you see on the set in Hollywood where a guy's holding the stick up in the air and with the right. microphone. That way nobody has to wear a microphone, uh, which I don't know if that's actually a good thing or not because now you've got people dancing around each other and, you know, there's a fish on the end of the line and you're trying to get audio <laughs> and it's just like, oh, it's just become, uh, I don't know. So we're, we're experimenting. We're we're trying our best just like everybody else. Um, and we're going to, God willing, we're going to have a new season of shows next year. It's going to be interesting gathering them this year. But uh, you and I, I hope to keep in touch and, you know, maybe we can share the field again this coming season. I do know when you get, when quarantine became a thing, you guys launched you and Tyler Webster and a couple others launched the Hunter's Happy Hour. How's that been going? Oh, that's fun. I mean, it doesn't get a lot of views, uh, but it, it, you know, I think we, I don't know what the numbers are on it, but yeah, we decided to like, we're all podcasters. So we're all used to talking on the phone. So we, we got together with uh, Doug Perinchio, who's, who would be the guy who would not take 30 minutes to set up this phone call on a computer. He knows his computers and he has a little company called soggy dog, a dog supply company. So, he knows all three of us. He says, I'll do the math. I'll do all the setup. I'll, I'll host it. You guys just click the link and pop up there. And so we get on every, well, now we're on Tuesdays. During the real shutdown of COVID, we were on Friday nights because people literally, there wasn't a restaurant open to go to. So um, now that yeah. things are loosening up a little bit, uh, I think we're going to, we might go to every other Tuesday now. But yeah, we bring a guest on, maybe one of our sponsors. And you know, our listeners get to interact with us a little more because on a podcast, they only get to listen, but here they can send in a question. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, Tyler and Nick and I and Doug, we can poke fun at each other. And, mm -hmm. you know, hunters, besides being out with our dogs and swinging at birds, what do we do? We poke fun at each other when we're not hunting, right? Right. That's and, the fun uh, of it. Yeah. That's the fun of it. That's the fun. I, I Like I told you before, I, I, I don't ever say that I hunt for the dogs. That's part of the reason but i hunt for the friendships and the places and uh so that yeah that that live hunters happy hour it's just like getting to see some friends once a week and uh you know we were like for the first both for the first month i didn't shave and then i cut it down to a mustache and now my hair i still i got i haven't gotten a haircut since uh whenever it was in march and uh you know we kid around about you know i'm gonna start needing a ponytail and my hair doesn't look as gray. So yeah, it's fun. It's, it's fun. You should, you should, I think, in fact, I think we got you slated, don't we, for next week? Yeah, I was going to say, spoiler alert, Tyler reached yeah, out to me and asked if I, if I would join you guys. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. I don't know what we're going to talk about. I'm sure we'll find something. Oh, if not, we'll just pick on each other. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not for thin skinned people. It's, it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, it, but it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, it just kills kills a couple hours one evening where typically everybody goes out somewhere, whether it's a restaurant or to a, somebody's backyard. You know, for all that time, really, people just weren't even families weren't even getting together. You know, my my grand yeah. my third grandson was born and we had to look at him through the window at the back of my daughter's house, you know, for the first week or two. So, yeah, the, the Hunter's Happy Hour was spurred by COVID, and there's a whole lot of other people that have started doing it. Um, I'm just thinking, to go back to what the flush is going through, is there going to be, I see, what about the flush giant Winnebago, like the mobile recording studio, podcast studio, filming studio, one of the big giant Winnebagos? I would never have to come back home. I would just live on the road. But the thing is, I have three wonderful little kids and a wife that I do have to see at some point. <laughs> so that would okay. be the only thing that would keep me from, from doing that. But yeah, wouldn't that be something just hit the road and we could do, I've already oh. talked about, you know, maybe we do just like, uh, because I've got, I've got an ice castle fish house and it's got air conditioning. It's got the beds. It's got the bathroom. Mm -hmm. It's got the refrigerator. It's got everything I need an oven, uh, you know, and I've got, you know, the grill, everything. So I've thought about this, maybe doing a road trip, from Minnesota to North Dakota to Montana, swing back through Wyoming, or you know, depending on when I go. And now I've got a handful of people that are, you know, yes, let's do this. And yeah. 
we it could be a possibility for this year. So that'd I'm be fun. Really, that'd I, be fun. I, it really would be. But the thing is, like, I, I mean, that could end up being a few weeks on the road. Uh, my wife is amazing, so she'd probably let me do it or would encourage me to do it. Be okay with it, I should say. Um, Here, but here's we'll what see. I would encourage. I would encourage you to do this. Set it up. Let me know your time frame. I'll come in in the middle of it, give you a little break, you buzz home, and I'll just host a show for a couple episodes. And then you come back, we do a transition show, I'll take off, and you can finish the rest of the season. You're either on to something or you're on something, my friend. I don't know which one it is, but I do like well, it. I do like it's, it. It's too early for beer, so I think I'm on to something. <laughs> I like it. Oh, Ron, I look forward to our next conference. Well, next week, Hunter's Happy Hour, yeah, but we'll do, it, we'll do this hour. again. We'll do this again if, if you'll join me. Um, we'll get this technology figured out for you at some point. Um, yeah. And it'll be seamless. And then, uh, we'll, we'll, I can't wait till we get to hunt together again. It'll be a good It'll adventure. Be fun. And I would like it to be in Alaska because I was listening to your podcast last week. And what did I do? I texted you. I'm like, <clears throat> do not make booking a trip to Alaska without me. So <laughs> I know, I know. Yes. That, that's, I got it. A, that's got it. Obviously this year it wouldn't work, but I'm, you count me in for 2021. I'm telling you what I've hunted bear up there. I've seen ptarmigan. I have not swung a shotgun in the state of Alaska. And Travis, I would love to do it. And I'll bring that little Cocker Spaniel of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll put it right in the shoulder bag. It could write right on the plane with us. I'm telling you, we'll go out there and take some ptarmigan, some Sharpies, uh, rough grouse, and you just get a hold of your guests that you had on the podcast and tell them we're coming. Yeah, no doubt. I, I took the Hall Road up to Prudhoe Bay and I was up in the Arctic Circle and I was standing in the brush in knee deep snow or waist deep snow. And I look over and boom, five feet from me is a charm again. And I'm, I'm like, oh. you are so lucky. I am not filming a bird hunting TV show right now. <laughs> yeah. and, I am good, and I'm coming back for you someday. And it's it's been at the very top of my list of places that I have to go. So I, dang, and I hope I get to make that happen someday. Hey, um, we, we did an island hunt. There's no reason yeah. we can't do a peninsula hunt because Alaska is one damn big peninsula. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, my friend. Appreciate it. Uh, there's two more airings this week of our bird hunting adventure out on the Beaver Island Archipelago Complex. I hope you enjoy it as much as Ron and I did making it happen. Next week on The Flush, we have a special episode that goes out to the bird dogs of The Flush, specifically Ron Sherr's dog, Raven, and Scott Franzen's dog, Izzy. Uh, they're special for many reasons. If you watch, I think you'll quickly understand why. Um, and that episode airs four times next week, just like all of our shows right now on the Outdoor Channel, Monday, Tuesday, Friday evening, and Saturday morning. You can find out more at theflush.tv, get all of our uh, show airings and times. And um, we hope you'll join us again next week on the, Flush, on the Flush Podcast. Ron Bain, thank you, my friend. You have a wonderful rest of your week. All right, thanks, Travis. It's a pleasure. Can't wait to see you again.